From education to employment, income to home ownership, African Americans endure a range of inequalities. But the gaps in health and wellness might be the most ominous of all these disparities. For too many of us, our primary health care comes in emergency rooms. Instead of preventive care, we're in catastrophic care. African-American men who, at an alarming rate, have been diagnosed with prostate cancers. Health disparities between black women and white women are well documented. Did you know that African-Americans are almost twice as likely to have diabetes? I would have to say, just based off of the patient population that I've experienced, you know, during my time here in Minnesota, in my professional career, and even in residency, we as African Americans will present one for later stages for cancers, more malignant forms of hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, overweight. There's also some resistance to the whole health culture. Mental health issues are real, and we have to understand that we can't pray away everything your health transfers over into other parts of your life. If you're sick, you can't go to work, so in terms of the economy, so it's kind of a ripple effect. These medical inequities are complicated by daunting and convoluted approaches to health insurance. I have a, a slight heart murmur, and, um, uh, and so it led to me being categorized as uh, uninsurable. I ended up having to pay $800 a month and with a $6,000 deductible, $3,000 for me and $3,000 for my children. Just the weight of premium and deductible. Uh, we have this, this dark cloud overhead. Pastor is a, a trusted voice. And so um, that's why I'm stepping forward. That's why I'm sharing my, basically sharing my story. And being a pastor, you see what happens to a lot of people who are, are not insured, young people and old people. The young people are, are really not thinking through just how important uh, health care is and, and living a healthy lifestyle is. Health care concerns may be far from the minds of many millennials, but feeling invincible can keep some young adults from considering health care options. My generation and the generation um, after me being accountable to uh, making sure that we are engaging. We want to know the nuts and bolts behind this. I'm an active member with the Temple of Hip Hop, uh, which is KRS-One's organization. You gotta keep doing this, you're okay, we're pursuing this. I'm one of the official hip hop cultural specialists that have been directly guided and taught by KRS-One as well as Menaces in Aru. Uh, what I do is just looking at everything through a hip hop lens. I mean, in essence, hip is a form of knowledge. To be hip is to be updated and relevant. Hop is a movement. So hip hop, in essence, is about intelligent movement. And so we're not just going to blindly follow just because the masses say, hey, go sign up for health care. Exclusion, discrimination, and the historic trauma that follows have created barriers to black participation in these systems. Over 200 years of a sort of hesitation towards the government structures and institutions and corporate structures and institutions. Um, so there's a lot of, we don't want to go to the doctor because we don't trust you. And I think that definitely goes back towards, you know, of course, the Tuskegee experiment. The healthcare system itself, it has created some distrust, and I definitely do understand that. My uh, parents grew up in the Deep South, in Jackson, Mississippi. When my mother had a toothache, uh, of course, they could not go in the front door. They had to go to the back door. They, they wouldn't actually fill your tooth. They would actually pull them. And so what it developed in her is this apprehension about going to the dentist that she lived with for many, many, many years, uh, even after moving to Minnesota. And that kind of fear I think is pretty uh, pervasive within the African American community. It's a fear that emanates from historical reality. This historical reality is that African Americans have been neglected and mistreated by medicine, health insurance, as well as banking and other financial systems. African Americans didn't come to this country as buyers and sellers and participants in the market in a traditional way. We were the property in the market that was being bought and sold medical experiments, malnourishment, 
poor hygiene, sexual assault, exposure to disease, violence, and many other maladies were visited upon the physical and mental health of enslaved Africans. Yeah, the thing that many people don't know is that for us, on many plantations, health care was attended to by veterinarians, not by physicians. So there's been a long, deep distrust of health and the care of our people. The medical and scientific community supported racist ideology with diagnoses specifically for blacks. Medical science even identified being black as a disorder, calling it negritude. The slave owners had to justify their treatment of my ancestors by convincing themselves that we were an inferior people. Therefore, denying health care, denying education, denying family, so they could live with themselves. Following slavery, from Reconstruction through Jim Crow segregation, separate but equal laws perpetuated the unequal access to health care. Some scholars conclude that much of today's health disparities are directly attributable to the slave health deficit and all that followed. But too often the focus is on the problems, pain, and pathos found in African American history. Discovering truth, revealing little known realities and surprising stories can offer inspiration and instruction, even in the world of healthcare insurance and other forms of financial self-sufficiency. You've heard before how we couldn't get pork chops so we made chitlins a delicacy. Well, in the same vein, uh, we had African-American leaders, primarily coming out of our religious community, ministers like Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, who at the end of the 18th century, while we were still struggling with slavery and disconnects of all sorts, created out of their religious fervor, mutual aid societies. Richard Allen, along with a number of other black Methodist bodies that came together, uh, formed the African Methodist Episcopal Church and incorporated, had our first general conference in 1816. The AME Church you know, initially started from uh, what we like to consider is the, the first sit-in in, in uh, Philadelphia in 1787, led by Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, and some worshipers uh, at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church where they were not uh, welcome to worship freely. After they completed their prayer, they walked out and they started the Free African Society, which was a benevolent society that was really focused on caring for those that really were having trouble caring for themselves. The Free African Society's Articles of Incorporation, written in the spring of 1787, call out a concern with health and wellness that resonates across the centuries as they stated, a society should be formed without regard to religious tenets, provided the persons lived an orderly and sober life in order to support one another in sickness and for the benefit of their widows and fatherless children. African Americans pool their funds that we might be able to bury our dead, that we might be able to take care of the widows, that we might be able to provide some health care for the youth. We can find mutual aid societies providing protection, providing funds for food, for education, libraries, um, homes that were founded for orphans of color who had nowhere to go, who couldn't be part of orphanages that served white people. All of these sorts of things as at the same time, they were fighting against slavery. In the very beginning, I mean, the, the black church was, was everything to the African-American. I mean, uh, it was a place where we, we did our, our theology, of course, and our, our, our politics. It was our conservatory of music. It was everything for the, for the African-American family and, and the African-American child. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about wholeness for people. If you look at Jesus in the Gospels as the story is told, he's always concerned about the wellness of people. Uh, people who were blind, he wanted to have sight. People who were deaf, he wanted them to be able to hear. People who were crippled, he wanted them to be able to walk straight. And people who were even having uh, issues with emotions, he wanted them to be whole, right? And so 
the church should operate the same way. The scriptures say that it is the desire of God that we prosper in our health in the same way that our soul would prosper. The holistic um, kind of philosophy that undergirds the black church comes out of our kind of collective struggle. And so we have to address and have had to address these kinds of issues collectively for some time. Well, it's an important model because at the time, um, there was no insurance for black folks. These uh, historic uh, works of these heroes evolved from mutual aid societies to, as we move further down the line, African-American insurance companies, the Atlanta Lifes, the Golden State Mutuals, the Supreme Life Insurances, the North Carolina Mutuals. A multi-million dollar enterprise operated solely by and for Negroes. Inside the home office this morning, switchboard operators, clerks, stenographers, bookkeepers and secretaries prepare for a routine day's work with their usual composed dignity. These came as responses of a community that was left out that decided it needed to take care of itself. Charles Spaulding makes his way through the busy third floor office to the early struggle of youth, the three white collars, and the day he closed his struggling grocery store to become general manager of Durham's first Negro insurance company, the North Carolina Mutual and Provident Association. What they did was so much a part of what our people did. Our people have always felt that they needed to lead the way in resolving those problems. You look back on history and you look back on our ancestors and our current elders and their ability to take ownership of the health of our community, you know, was so powerful. Cooperatives offered another avenue of economic self-reliance. We think about slavery as an economic institution. You can see why it would be very easy and seem like common sense to many African Americans to form economic cooperatives that actually go against the grain of that hyper-individualistic, exploitative capitalism because they and their families and their friends had been debased by that kind of capitalism. And you see figures from Du Bois to Ella Baker to Ida B. Wells and others calling for African Americans to not you know, turn their backs on trying to build wealth, but to do it in a different way, a way that would not be so exploitative. In Oklahoma, this section of Tulsa that had lots of African-American owned businesses, and people like to call it the Black Wall Street of the Midwest. Well, Wall Street has this connotation of hyper-capitalism, making money, getting a good return on your investment. But obviously, the people who put together what we call Black Wall Street in hindsight were working together the whole time. It's not that they were trying to leverage futures or something like this. They were bringing people together, creating credit unions, grocery stores, small businesses that they knew people in their, in their neighborhood would frequent, and they also knew were under siege. And and unfortunately, in this case, that came true with a white race riot that just completely destroyed that part of town. Many people have started to talk again about the history of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, which brought sharecroppers together to pool their resources and try to get better ways of selling their crops and getting fair prices, as well as fair rent on the lands that they worked. So these spaces we usually think of as places where people are just hiding and scared and waiting for the civil rights movement decades from now to happen. But actually, if we look at this history very closely, we can see people across the country banding together and trying to make a better life by using these cooperative entities to leverage the power of the group. The strong history of African American labor unions offers yet another example of effectively engaging in economic systems. People know what a union is in terms of laborers negotiating with management. However, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which is one of the most important labor organizations founded by African Americans, also had a ladies auxiliary 
And those two organizations, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and their Ladies Auxiliary, created cooperative economic institutions, including grocery stores and credit unions, to help members and their communities become economically stronger. We don't want to romanticize the kind of self-reliance efforts that occurred during the Jim Crow or slavery past. Uh, people making pretty bold statements about how Jim Crow helped keep black people together. I think that's a very dangerous path to go down. However, I think it is important for us to relearn or learn for the first time a lot of the stories of African-American community cooperative economic development. While African-Americans have had to create self-sufficient systems for health care since the first decades of nationhood, the broader American journey towards affordable health care is a long and difficult one that goes back to the progressive era. Remarkable thing about health insurance and the, the clarity that we've had in these United States about how important health care is, we hearken all the way back to Theodore Roosevelt. In 1909, Roosevelt organized the first White House Conference on the Health of Dependent Children. But with the progressive era fading and with the start of World War I, federal efforts on health care faltered. His cousin later, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, pressed for universal health care. He ended up coming away with Social Security. FDR had to remove health care coverage to assure passage of the Social Security Bill in 1935. He tried for health care reform again in the late 30s but the decline of the New Deal and the outbreak of World War II ended these efforts. Harry Truman pressed for universal health care and was unable to achieve it. Subsequently, we had efforts by Lyndon Johnson and Nixon, William Jefferson Clinton and Hillary, all to achieve health care. None were able to achieve it. 98 years of struggle in this country towards universal health care was unable to achieve it. So the work of President Obama to bring forward health care is a source of pride for us. I'm not the first president to take up this cause, but I am determined to be the last. At the end of the day, no matter what side of the aisle, improving health care was important to everyone. It was just how you get there. And we're going to sign this bill. More challenges remained after the Affordable Care Act became law. From Supreme Court decisions to the development of the online marketplaces, the process continued to be contentious and controversial. What we're going to do to today is create your account okay. on the Minsure site and complete an application and submit it. But now it's more about people and less about politics. It's about making sure everyone can access these marketplaces to get the best health care insurance for themselves and their families. I am Tamika Todi, Minsure Navigator Coordinator for Stairstep Foundation. I was sent a letter to reapply mm -hmm. my insurance uh, by computer. Major's concern was he didn't have um, access to computer or internet at home. I said, come on in, Major, we'll sit down and we'll take care of this. So in this section, we'll add the other people that are in your household. Okay. He had a couple questions along the way, so I was able to answer those questions. We have had some glitches, and the nice thing about the tool is there's so much support. If there's a, a case where um, online's not available, we can still do a paper application. So it's really a nice support community. There's always backup. That is the process all done. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. You. When we're able to see this positive change and see um, individuals getting their household covered. And it's also nice to see when there's people that might have been paying these huge premiums and, and deductibles and had these pre-existing issues, seeing them having affordable coverage. It's, it's really nice. Because you get used to forking out that close to thousand dollars a month. And, uh, but when the, the numbers came up and you, you, it, was, it was a revelation and it was, uh, it was a blessing, uh, it was a life changing. I've, I have kids in college and so, uh, three in fact, and so those monies can be used elsewhere. So I, I'm really, I'm, I'm grateful. It's not enough for me to benefit. And I think that the church is an incredible venue or avenue through which uh, this story should be told. That we have a responsibility to empower people, our people and people in general. 
We have been setting up mass community enrollment events in churches. We answer any questions that individuals might have, and then we actually do enrollment right there on site. So we're enrolling people right there at those events. We hosted one Minsure navigation session after our Sunday worship where we had several navigators come out and assist uh, folks with getting signed up. And uh, it was an awesome time. And it was good to, to uh, be able to be involved in helping people uh, get the health care that they need. Without that trusted voice, we, we found that in our, our community, uh, people won't step forward. People won't get in, in, engaged. They won't sign up. Our events are open to the public. They're held in churches around the community, but they're open to the surrounding neighborhoods. So we're, re we're reaching everyone. I remember sitting with a white male coming into a little Baptist church, him just kind of looking around at, at all the children running, you know, and, and just being amazed and, and welcomed and helped. I understand the fear that can come along when you don't have coverage for your family. And I understand the the bills that can pile up because you're still <laughs> doing those things that you have to do to um, protect your family. We had two that were off to college and we had three that remained at home. And we had to make some real decisions because both parents being outside of the house at the exact same time with childcare for three children becomes a little challenging. And my wife could not, uh, uh, we had to have surgery for her. I mean, I mean major surgery uh, about eight weeks ago. And in the process of having major surgery about eight weeks ago, uh, when we first signed up for uh, Minshaw, uh, as a man, as a husband, as a father, uh, it was a very proud moment to say, you know, honey, children, we have this insurance, and dad was able to get this done. The pride that he can have in signing his family up, especially for the men in the community to be able to kind of have that as an example and be like, yeah, you know what, that's great. If it worked for him, it'll work for me. We are in 40 years now of hip hop culture. Really when it kind of got started, it was all just about the self-expression, um, self-reliance. But at the same time, now that we're at 40 years, we see a lot of the pioneers of the culture who are aging, who are looking at different health issues. Cool DJ Herc, who is one of the, the pioneers of the culture, uh, back in 2011, he actually ended up uh, having kidney stones. Of course, no health insurance. This is something now that the masses of the hip hop community are beginning to start to look at, but they're not gonna just sign up blindly. So there has to be an awareness campaign. There has to be some outreach. There has to be community engagement. The Invincibles think they're young and they're gonna live forever. And it's just good to inform them of the importance of health insurance and coverage. And you wanna have it and not need it versus need it and not have it. It's important to take care of yourself and have access to all of those health resources and do the preventative steps versus the catastrophic care. There's a writer who said we're all just temporarily able-bodied. And so if we think about health care in that way and we think about preventative care, getting into that system and thinking about yourself as actually doing a social good by being part of a healthcare system is another way of thinking about it. We can be the model for the nation about how to get health care for everybody and how to get the community healthy. The reality is we're in this together. It, this is a, uh, a, um, a life-changing thing and has been a life-changing thing for a lot of people. and. Uh, I think ultimately uh, will change our, our, the world in which we live. I think the biggest thing is having uh, the know of who started this process and why it began and, and why we have to arrive to this place. We understand how important health care is. If we understand that history of, of the mutual aid societies and the African-American health insurance companies that we might move from a place of disadvantage to a place of inclusion and respect. I know that Absalom Jones and Richard Allen thrill to think that President Barack Obama thought enough about the importance of universal health care that he staked his entire political capital on achieving it. Glory to God, 2010, he was able to stroke the pen.
Discovered Truth, a healthcare journey, is a Minnesota partnership co-production of Minsure, on the web at minsure.org, the Stair Step Foundation, and Twin Cities Public Television. Thank you.